read the, the actual historical reference point, it was fascinating. So in, in the north of Nigeria, being gay is punishable by death, by stoning. Like, it's that bad, right? But historically, there has been a group in the north called the Yandaudu. And the Yandaudu were people who were born as men, but they were feminine, and they wore female clothing and occupied female roles in society, usually sleeping with men, right? And so they were an accepted part of how the society, and they lived in a, they had a specific place. So it's like, you know, if your child was a certain way, you'd be like, oh, they're Yandaudu. And then that would be their role in society. So there were spaces carved out for people who did not ascribe to cis heteronormative ways, white cis heteronormative ways of thinking, right? That has always existed. Another example is, um, so in Angola, 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 a, a lot of people, I'm, just, I'm not sure, it's Black History Month right now, so a lot of people are talking about Queen Nzinga of Ndongo. And so Queen Nzinga led one of the biggest rebellions against Portuguese rule. She's like seen as like a, you know, a huge African female leader of resistance in the 16th century. And she fought against the Portuguese for 40 years. Amazing ruler. There's a famous painting of her where the port she came in to the to meet with the Portuguese for negotiations, and they said they said that she had to sit on the ground. She just looked and she was like, so she brought one of her. So she's like she beckoned one of the men in her entourage. She beckoned him, and he said he got on all fours, and she sat on his back so she would sit at eye level with them. So that's kind of the person she was. You know, she's kind of a boss. You know, she's a boss. She fought until her death against colonial rule. Interesting thing about her, though, is that they call her Queen Nzinga because this is how we think about it from a Western perspective, because she was a woman. But her title was, OK, please, people might correct me, but I believe it was Ngola, Ngolo, Ngolo. But basically, whatever the title was, it actually meant king. And so she dressed in all male clothing and she had a harem of young men who dressed as women who were her wives, right? And the Europeans observed this. They wrote it down. They're like, oh, what is this? This bastard, this horrible, da, da, da. So she, lived, she was a king, and she had a harem of young wives, you know, who were men, men dressed as women. So it shows you that Africans have always thought about gender and sexuality in very, very different ways, historically. And it came down to... European colonization, which really just erased that history, which has changed that history. And some of the major kind of turning points you see, especially with um, Christian missionaries coming in to the continent, and also a lot of like European thought leaders in terms of Orientalism and gender um, and their thoughts being imposed. One of the major people was Sir Richard Burton. So. He was an Orientalist in England. I'm gonna stop with history soon, but I'm trying to give you a little bit of background on like why we are here today. Sir Richard Burton, he was an English Orientalist in the 1800s, and he created this idea called the Sotadic Zone. So the Sotadic Zone was he he was like he made a map. This white man made a map, and he was like, all the places I point to here, homosexuality exists, and it is natural. All the places I don't point to, homosexuality does not exist. He literally just made it up. He's, and the places he said that homosexuality does not exist is sub-Saharan Africa. And the reasoning he had was that black people were so close to the level of animals that we were only capable of the natural heterosexual impulse. Literally, we are so close to animals that all we can do is be animals and be heterosexual. Despite the fact that homosexuality has been observed in every animal species. So when I, I mean, this, this nigga was wrong, like he's basic. But this is the type of thought processes that have informed the ways in which now, after hundreds of years of colonization, especially with missionaries coming in, that now a lot of us Africans have internalized that. 
you know, it's not the idea that we've, that we've never been there. You know, it's not that homosexuality is un-African. Homophobia is un-African, because these ideas were created by the West. They were imposed in terms of actual legislation during colonial regimes to control the black body, right? It's like, okay, if you can control the ways in which people see themselves, in which people interact with each other, it's all about control. And so there are anti-buggery laws, all these different things that were passed, the missionaries, came in and imposed their ways of seeing the world, of seeing ourselves as black people. And it continues to this day. Th hundreds, thousands of missionaries have gone and are still going. There's an amazing film on Netflix called God Loves Uganda. It talks about how these missionaries have just been coming in, the American evangelicals, because they also see, oh, we've lost our culture war in the US. Let's go to Africa save these black people from the vices of the West, right? So it's the same idea. It's like, oh, homosexuality is a Western thing. Remember the Sotatic Zone. Oh, it's natural in, the, in Europe, but it's not natural in Africa, right? Oh, so they're imposing it again, and there's an amazing scene in it, which I think I remember incorrectly, but it might not be corrected. There's an amazing scene in it where um, in Uganda, there was a law that was initially proposed that would make homosexuality punishable by death, by death so bad and in uh, the <laughs> basically one of the evangelical ministers came in and met with the parliamentary leaders and almost I think maybe that day or very soon afterwards they proposed this anti-gay bill and this was a, one of the most homophobic evangelical leaders who was literally proselytizing about homosexuality and homophobia. He came in and literally they proposed this bill soon afterwards. It's not coincidental. It's not coincidental. And people are dying because of it. LGBTQ people are being brutalized in Africa, being killed because of this. And it comes back to the West. And so fast forward, here we are today, right? And so uh, my experience was based in this experience of colonization, right? Like my, when my parents told me that, you know, oh, You've been corrupted by the West. Chukuma, you've been corrupted by the West. Like, there's no way that you can be gay. You can't be queer and African. It's impossible. It comes back to that idea, that history of colonization, you know, and that solitude, you know, and there's, and there's never any types of mirrors that I had in my life in terms of media representation to prove them wrong, right? until I saw the work of Zanoli Maholi. And so I've become like low key obsessed with <laughs> just creating new visions of, especially for LGBTQ Africans in diaspora, because there's been some work, not enough, you know, there's been much more work done on LGBTQ Africans, but there's been some done on the continent, but not as much done on our experiences in North America and Europe. Like, you know, it, that's an additional form of displacement. It's like, you know, for me, especially, if somebody calls me un-African, so I'm already, okay, part Swedish, so it's like, man, you're not really, you know, but you're that, and then you grew up in America. So even when I'm there, people are like, oh, you're American, you're not really Nigerian, but you're queer on top of it. These are all additional parts of displacement that are added in by being an immigrant, right? Um, you're already displaced physically from your homeland, and now like, there's all this rhetoric, which also displaces you kind of like metaphysically in some ways as well. And so, um, due to colonization. And so, I, I focus on those experiences in diaspora because it's also the experience that I've had. Um, I can't speak for people on the continent, right? But it's the experience I've had um, growing up here in North America. And it's been incredible. You know, I've shot 34 people, LGBTQ, LGBTQ Africans for Limitless to date. And, it's just been really interesting seeing how so many of our narratives are connected, especially around this idea of us being seen as un-African. Almost everybody I've spoken to who is sub-Saharan African specifically has had that same experience. Like, oh, you're un-African. Oh, you're this. Or they've heard of it, you know? So it's not something I'm making up. You know, a lot of us have experienced it. And there's agency for us to change narratives, 
Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie had an amazing quote where she said, culture does not make people, people make culture. And she continues just saying that, you know, for example, if a, our culture does not respect the full humanity of women, we need to change that culture. And I think by extension, that idea of culture not being this fixed quantity, it extends in these ways as well to LGBT, to sexuality, to um, gender. Um, and so we can change these things. And just as colonization destroyed our original indigenous understandings of colonization, uh, oh no, of gender and sexuality, you know, as we kind of brought up, up you know, the idea of Queen Nzinga, who was a king, had a harem of young boys, you know what I'm saying, who were wives, you know, um, the Andaudu, who have existed, who continue to exist. Just as colonization has destroyed those aspects of our culture, we have agency to recreate and to reform for ourselves what culture is and what culture means for us. And so it's exciting for me to see art as one of these tools. And I think just across the board, there's so many ways in which we can all work on kind of tackling these issues and the kind of larger anti-colonial struggle. And because black people, we've been fighting, we've been fighting, Hundreds, you know, hundreds of years, you know, and this is just an extension of that struggle. From in, in my opinion, you know, challenging the idea that being LGBTQ and African are not this, are not, not, are not just like oppositional things, is a part of fighting against colonization. And when we can find that space of loving ourselves, loving each other as Black people, and healing ourselves, that is an act of revolution in and of itself. And so, I'm really excited to have been invited to speak on the Ubuntu Talks. I think that this is also a really important forum in which we can just have these conversations with each other. And I just hope that like, you know, as we continue this fight, um, we just kind of like, just remember things that, you know, it's even, yeah, just remember even the small things that like the West is not this like perfect haven that we kind of can construct it as, you know, a lot of things have just been stolen from us as black people from Africa. And so everything that's been built here has been built off of our backs. Everything has been stolen. Right. And so um, I, I just am very confident in our ability to continue to shift our narratives for ourselves and to build a new and brighter vision and a brighter future for all of us.